Okay, now let's talk about Chapter 12, Project Procurement Management. So procurements are um, getting materials that we need from outside sources. So on a project, oftentimes, we may not do everything. We may get help from outside companies, and we may have contracts with those companies to get part of the work done. Work that we may not do, we may have someone else do. Okay, so that's what Project Procurement Management is all about. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMP prep materials at projectprep.org. We've got cheat sheets, full-length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. And there's three processes in this chapter. There's plan procurement management, and that's in planning, conduct procurements and executing, and then control procurements and monitoring and controlling. So in plan procurement mon management, we're documenting the procurement method and identifying potential sellers. We're trying to determine what we're going to do, and we're going to have help from others to do. And we're going to identify potential sellers or vendors that could provide us those things. And then conducting procurements is all about collecting seller responses. So we're getting feedback from sellers about how much they would charge us to get that work done. And then we're going to choose a seller and award a contract. And then we're going to control procurements, manage procurement relationships, and monitor contract performance. So if we're in a contract with someone who's helping us getting part of the work done, on the project, we want to make sure that they're actually fulfilling their end of the obligation. Okay, so now let's talk about plan procurement management. One of the key tools here, two of the key tools, is maker by analysis and market research. So in maker by analysis, we're trying to determine what work we're going to do on our own or we're going to make and what we're going to have to buy from someone else or what we'd like to buy from someone else. That's that maker by analysis. And then market research is trying to determine uh, to examine industry and vendor capabilities to determine who could do what we need. Is there actually even a seller or a vendor out there that could provide what we're looking for? So those are tools used in planned procurement management. Then there's some outputs here of planned procurement management. There's the procurement management plan documenting how we're going to get the goods and services that we need from external organizations. Then there's the procurement statement of work. This is the portion of the scope from the scope baseline that will be included within a contract. So we're trying to determine what we're going to get help on, what we need a procurement for. We're going to look at the scope baseline and kind of just pull things out that would be included in a contract. Those things are going to go into our procurement statement of work. Then there's bid documents. When we try to get proposals from sellers or vendors about how much it's going to cost to get that work done that we're looking for, we use bid documents to help us provide that information to suppliers. So you could use something like a request for information, an RFI, a request for proposal, an RFP, or a request for quotation, or an RFQ. Those are all documents that we would send to prospective sellers to get their feedback on the services they can, or, or products they can provide us, and at what price. Then there's maker by decisions. We're determining what we're going to make or do on our own, and what we're going to buy from outside sources. Then there's source selection criteria. This is um, kind of like our scorecard, how we're going to grade or score potential sellers and vendors because we want to we may have hope well, hopefully we have a few different options of sellers and we want to pick which one would be the best fit for us and we're going to use source selection criteria as kind of our uh, grade reporter means of scoring them and we could also have independent cost estimates as an output of this process just obtaining a cost estimate from a third party to forecast contract costs we're getting advice or input from someone else that we won't be selling or won't be selling to us because they could provide, kind of provide us an independent um, viewpoint. It's kind of like if you go to a doctor and they give you a diagnosis, you might want another outside party, another doctor, to give you, to con kind of confirm your diagnosis. It's getting an independent estimate, just kind of a good practice. And here's just kind of show, to, to kind of show you the idea of a, of a statement of work. Remember, we're taking the scope baseline and pulling portions out that will go into a contract. That's the statement of work, the portion of scope that will be included within a contract. And here's an example of source selection criteria. If we're trying to buy planes, some of the ways that we might score sellers are what's the cost that they're going to charge us for the plane? When can they complete it? Have they performed well on previous projects that we've paid them to do? And just on and on. Those are different ways to select or score potential sellers. Okay, so this is all about planned procurement management. Now let's talk about conducting procurements. This is where we're like selecting a seller and starting or awarding a contract. 
So here's some of the tools of that. You could have bidder conferences, so you could be meeting with um, all of the possible sellers or vendors, so you can give them feedback on the, um, the work that needs to be done, and they can ask you questions. It's just to kind of make sure that everyone's aware of what's needed, and um, they can ask questions if they have them about what needs to be done. And then you're going to use proposal evaluation. This is some formal way of evaluating uh, different contract proposals or proposals from sellers. You could be using advertising, too, to draw on more potential sellers. Ideally, you could have a lot of options for sellers, and advertising could be a way to attract sellers. Then you could use negotiations. These are used to clarify the structure, requirements, and terms so an agreement can be reached. You might have to negotiate with a potential seller um, so that everyone can come to an agreement on a good contract. And then the outputs of conduct procurement are probably pretty obvious. You're going to have selected sellers, those are who are selected to perform the work, who you've chosen to, to get the work done. And then agreements or contracts with them. You could include things like the deliverables that you expect from them, the schedule baseline, performance reporting, how you're going to track um, how things are going, roles and responsibilities on the contract, pricing and payment terms. Maybe you're going to pay them um, per deliverable, or maybe you're going to pay them by the hour. I guess it depends. The place of delivery, inspection and acceptance criteria, warranty, penalties, incentives. These are all things that you could be including in a contract with a potential seller. Okay, now let's talk about contract types that are used. There's really three key contract types, fixed price, cost reimbursable, and time and materials. We're going to talk about each of those in detail. And there's a few different flavors of each of those categories. So fixed price contracts, uh, it's fixed. The contract is a fixed price for a defined product or service. And sellers are legally obligated to complete the work. They've got to do it. And buyers need to be precisely specifying what, what they're looking for. So in order for it to be fixed price, the seller has to pretty much know uh, pretty, you know, pretty specifically exactly what is needed. That gives them a good fixed price estimate, or helps them to uh, prepare that. It may also include some incentives if we, if the seller achieves certain objectives. And if there's a change in scope, it may actually require an increase in contract price because it's fixed price for fixed scope. If we want to add scope, probably going to have to pay a little bit more for it. Here's an example of a fixed price contract. Let's talk about mowing lawns. Uh, many of us mowed lawns as kids. A fixed price contract for mowing a lawn might be getting paid $50 to mow it. It's a fixed fee. Now here's a few different flavors of fixed price contracts. There's firm fixed price, FFP, fixed price incentive, FPIF, fixed price with economic price adjustment, FPEPA. So a firm fixed price contract is when the price is set at the start and not subject to change. It's not subject to change. A fixed price incentive fee contract is one where there's a fixed price that's set at the start, plus there may be additional incentives for the seller if they achieve certain agreed upon metrics. Maybe if it's, um, you know, they get it done by a certain date sooner than expected, or if they meet a certain technical performance, if they meet these um, objectives, we may give them an incentive payment in addition to the fixed price. Then there's fixed price with economic price adjustment. So these are usually used for contracts where uh, that spans several years. And we may, even though the contract is fixed, potentially for future years, maybe not the first year, we may have adjustments based on some changing conditions such as inflation. And it should be against some reliable financial index something that's reliable and that we can trust. So here's an example of each of those. So firm fixed price, again, that's $50 to mow a lawn. Here's fixed price incentive fee. It's still $50, there's a fixed price, but maybe we offer them or, or a, a $5 incentive if the person who's mowing the lawn gets it done by January 21st or something. If they get it done sooner, they get that incentive. Now here's fixed price with economic price adjustment. Maybe we have a contract with the person mowing the lawn over a several year period, and we say, okay, for the first year, it'll be $50 to mow a lawn, plus a 2% increase next year for inflation or something. 
So those are the three flavors of fixed price contracts. So now let's talk about cost reimbursable. This is when the seller is reimbursed for their actual cost plus a fixed fee. So it provides some flexibility if you as a buyer or project manager or whatever don't know exactly at the start what you're going to need to provide. There's some flexibility there. Gives us some options. Fixed price contracts may not always work if we can't clearly specify exactly what is needed. So here's a cost reimbursable contract. Still going back to mowing lawns. Maybe we're going to pay the seller $20. That's the fixed fee, so there's some fixed fee, plus the cost of gas, plus employee pay. That's an example of a cost reimbursable contract. Now, within these cost reimbursable contracts, there's three flavors. Cost plus fixed fee. So we're reimbursing the seller for all allowable costs plus a fixed fee. And what's important here is that fixed fee is a percentage of the initial estimated project costs, not the final costs. It's the estimate or percentage of the initial estimated project costs. Then we've got cost plus incentive fee contracts. So we're reimbursing them, the seller, for all allowable costs, and they may receive a predetermined incentive fee if they meet certain objectives. And then there's cost plus award fee. I don't personally see these very often, but it's a type. We're reimbursing the seller for all allowable costs, and the majority of the fee the additional fee is earned based on satisfying broad subjective performance criteria. The decision is based solely on the subjective determination of the seller performance by the buyer. So anyway, that one doesn't seem to make a lot of, a lot of sense, but it's out there. Okay, so let's talk about these three flavors, examples of them. So cost plus fixed fee, we're paying the fixed fee plus the cost of gas and employee pay. And that fee is based on the a percentage of the initial estimated project cost. Now here's cost plus incentive fee. It's costs, gas, plus employee pay, the costs of those, plus $20 if the lawn is mowed by January 21st. Cost plus incentive fee. Now here's cost plus award fee. We're going to reimburse them for gas and employee pay, and we'll give them $20 if the lawn is viewed by beautiful, is viewed beautiful by us, the buyer cost plus award fee. Now here's the final category of contracts. It's time and materials, T and M. It's really kind of a hybrid, sort of a mix of the two. And it's often used for staff augmentation when a precise statement of work cannot be defined. So maybe we need some additional staff to help us on the project, but we're not really clear exactly what we want them to do. We may have some idea, but not with exactness. So it's the similarities to cost reimbursable contracts is that they can be somewhat left open-ended. Um, there's some flexibility. And when it comes to fixed price contracts, the similarity is that it may require not to exceed values and time limits. Okay, so here's an example of that. Again, we're going back to mowing, or let's actually use landscaping here. So maybe we pay a landscaper $30 an hour. We might not know exactly what we want to have them do, to have them do. Maybe we have them get started, and as they do, we start to realize what we um, do want and what we don't want. It gives us just some, I don't know, further thoughts about that. Um, so it's thirty dollars an hour for a professional landscaper, and we'll have them work on various projects for the next month, but we can't exceed two thousand dollars in costs. That's an example of a time and materials contract.